The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm James Rookley and I've got the pleasure of chatting again with Jono or Jonathan Mannion, Sandringham Wealth. Jono, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. Really appreciate um, you and I were chatting a few weeks back now. It was kind of pre-30 pre June. You were generous with your time uh, around some, some SOA things that I was trying to work on here. And, and anyway, we, we got... Got to talking about ensemble, and you, you mentioned finding your community, and I thought, oh, we need to, we need to get you on. Um, so thank you for thank you for joining me. Tell us a bit. We were just chatting about your office, and we might slice the audio to kind of bring that bring that part back in again. I was um, so for anyone that doesn't follow Jono, you're uh, you're active on TikTok and a few other places. That's how I've gotten to gotten to know you. I was just commenting to say that your your office looks like. I could have sworn you're in the spare room at home. The the, the the setup, the background for your videos. You know, we're chatting here on on a on a on a, on a video platform anyway. But yeah, talk us through your office setup. That that's uh, that's impressive. So basically, when you know when the business started, I started um, renting up a space. I was renting from uh, my accountant, and it was good. But you don't really get that sense of ownership, and you're only ever renting somebody else's space. Um, and as the business has grown and then we want to expand, um, I wanted to effectively, I wanted to plant the flag in the ground and say, right, this is where we operate for the next 20 years. And I, you know, there's a very particular way that I would like things to be set up. I want, I want an experience when you walk in the door, I want it to um, look and feel and smell a certain way. And the office, sometimes when you're in a sort of a sterile meeting room, it can feel like a sterile meeting room, but here I've got it set up. To a large degree, the way that I want it to look and feel and, and smell, it's never sort of complete, but it's it's well on the way. Hmm. But no, I, I can't can't work at home. I think I learned that during COVID very clearly. Yep. So do you, do you own the office space? You're not renting it anymore. You are. You yes. Want? Yep. So there on it uh, sits in the in the Seek fund. Um, hmm. So it's you know part of what's in Seek fund. Yeah. And I feel a TikTok video coming on. Ah. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's like that. That that would do really well. The the LRBA buying your office space or your warehouse, you know, if you've got a factory type type business, I do. You know, get a lot of inquiries from those types of people via TikTok. But yeah, talking of your own experience in doing it yourself would be would be interesting. It's it was really interesting. So it, I mean, it's part of the advice that we provide because I do just you know, for whatever reason have quite a few business owners. And providing the advice is very different from going through it yourself. There were times where I wanted to sit in a corner and just rock. Um, and, you know, from an advice point of view, because you're on the other side of the table, these are the things that need to happen. Here's the advice that's going. When you're actually dealing with the lender and the broker and the lawyers and trying to coordinate the project, manage the whole thing, much, much more complicated. Yeah, and, and and actually, you know, there's value in that to talking through clients through it to say I've been through the process as well. This is what worked well. This is what didn't work well. Because like uh, I myself have advised plenty of clients on doing it. Have I done it myself? No, I haven't done it myself. So there's you know there's a lot to be said for being going through the process yourself. It's not to be honest. It's not one that I'd want to go through again. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it would really have to, you know, there was a real motivator um, from the business point of view. Um, from a numbers point of view, it certainly stacked up. But, it, you know, it's not one of those things that I would, I would go through uh, happily again. Yeah. So, so tell us about Sandringham Wealth. To, to be honest, when I first came across you online, I just, I thought you were, had a financial planning business in Sandringham down here in Victoria. But but I've from some of the other videos that you put up, I've learned you're not in Victoria. Where, where, where are you? No, so we, we used to be, we used to live in Bell, um, but we got to the point where, you know, we looked at it and said, right, if we wanted to move out of Richmond and into, say, Hawthorne, it was taking on another million dollars worth of debt. And you can do it, but there's a, there's a cost that comes to that in terms of your time and focus and family stuff. Um, and we moved from uh, Melbourne up to Newcastle, lifestyle, a bit close to the ocean because that's my happy place. And Sandringham was basically, it was a sort of a nod to mum and dad. That was uh, Sandringham Place was the first home uh, that we lived in. And it was one, it was just such a beautiful home as a kid. I think as an adult, you look back and go, you know, maybe less so. But as a kid, it was, you know, like this fantastic place. Um, so it was in Sandringham Place, and that was the sort of the nod to, to mum and dad. So Sandringham Wells. Ah, there you go. Love it. Great story. What is, so, so what does the business look like at the moment? What, t- tell us a bit of, what's the kind of the bit of the backstory? Because you, you were in the bank f- previously. Yeah, you know, I did. I started off, you know, we moved to Australia six, 16, 17 years ago. And, yeah. And the stuff that I did, I spent eight years in the UK and sort of uh, towards the end of a sort of prime brag image and stopped lending. And that stuff just didn't exist in Melbourne. Um, and I, I really wasn't convinced that I wanted to deal with institutional clients and then sort of found a, a really small niche um, financial advice, um, start lending and uh, investment bank all in one. Uh, and that was sort of where I got a sort of my, I guess, a foot in the door and then moved through uh, a practice that was eventually acquired by AMP. Um, that wasn't necessarily going to work for me. Uh, so I went through the banks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as the world of banks were exiting, I looked at it and went, you know, do I, you know, it's it's one of those watershed moments where I go, right, do I want to take the plunge and go and set up my own practice or am I comfortable being an employee forever um, and chose to start my own practice. So I didn't, I didn't take my book. Um, I, you know, I basically started day one back at square one with United Dollars worth of revenue, which is scary when you've got, you know, a family to support and and you've got to put runs on the board. It's you know, it's intimidating stuff. But that's sort of where the where the business started. And then, you know, now it's me still sole advisor, two team members, uh, parent planner slash associate advisor and administrator. Uh, and it's just the three of us. There are and so did you start did you start the business when you were in Melbourne and, and then move to Newcastle or did you start it when you were in Newcastle? Like what was the timing around moving as well? So I moved from uh, from one of the banks uh, when I was in Melbourne, left there, it started a, sort of a fresh with a, with a different bank up here, did five years in that bank and then everything sort of uh, was on the, on the way to winding up. Yeah. And then so we've been operating now for four and a half years yeah. in the business. And going well for you? Like, what do you, what does your, what does your client base look like? Who do you, who are you working with? Who are you, who are your typical clients? Um, so from a from a client point of view, it's high income, time poor professionals, and traditionally my clients are probably smarter than me. They probably earn more money than me. Um, you know, it's, it's a really sort of smart switched on client base. I love working with, with people like that. And um, we've probably only got 70 odd ongoing clients at the moment, um, pretty close to 70. Yeah. And we're still saving on a couple more, but it's not, um, you know, it's, we're probably going to get to a point where I say, right, well, we're now sort of year or at capacity. And then, you know, it's, I guess, look at the clients that we've got. Yeah. And, and so, no plans to take on another advisor or someone that's in your team to, for them to go to go through, you keep it as the solo advisor. Uh, it's really interesting. It's trying to it's trying to work out: do I want to build a business or do I just love being an advisor? Yeah, and like I love I love both parts of it, but I'm not a hundred percent convinced that I want to grow and expand 
Uh, I saw some really interesting research. Um, Michael Kitsis had done a, uh, a thing about, and you know, they tracked advisor happiness. And they said, you know, advisor happiness dips until you get more support in them, and then it rises. And then, you know, it, it dips again when you take on more advisors, but your revenue grows. And it was this constant sort of up and down. And I'm, I'm getting to the point where, you know, that's the sort of the question in my mind. I've actually got the, I mean, she would be the absolute ideal person to bring into the business. Um, but it's, you know, whether or not I do it and then when. Because particularly the, like the social, I mean, the way that you and I caught up was via you know, TikTok. That stuff is ready to take off now. Yeah. And there probably is the capacity to take on uh, another advisor. It's just whether or not I've got the, oh, the strength. Yeah. And, and look, it's the classic financial planning question. Is it like, well, what do you actually want to do? There's, sure, you can take on another advisor and, and grow a business if you want to, or you can keep, you know, have your 70, 80 clients or whatever number you decide is, is, is enough. And, be comfortable and earn your revenue and happy days. It's like you can do whatever you want. It's your business. Okay. And uh, it's the financial planning question what do you want to do? Yeah. And that's the trick. That's the bit that I'm still weighing up at the moment. Mm-hmm. I'm still leading towards just being um, solo advisor. And it's really interesting because a lot of, you know, a lot of, I've listened to a lot of the podcast episodes and sort of the providing sentiment seems to be that a solo advisor, you know, one man band uh, isn't sustainable. And I reckon it is. Yeah, would be very, very comfortably so. I think you've got to have the right sort of setup, um, and you've got to watch, you know, the, the cost element. Um, but you know, and I, I see this as sustainable long term. Yeah. It's just whether or not I take somebody else on and grow. Yeah, and f- and and what what type of support do you get into the business from others? You know, aside from, as it sounds like, there's a couple of direct employees with yep. with you. Yeah, but what other what other services from your licensee or, or or anywhere else? What what other services are you taking on so that you can kind of confidently say, like you've just said, that you're happy being a solo advisor and you think it's sustainable? I think it's probably the network and having that really good strong network to say, right, the bit that I'm really good on is this bit. Yep. Um, I'm not going to start going too far down this that kind of path because I've got a guy that that I can refer to who is an absolute guru. It's literally all he does. You want to do mortgage breaking. I can give you some rough idea as to what to expect, but really, this is the guy that you need to speak to. Uh, there are a couple of brokers that I um, refer to. They've got very set niches, both really specialised. You know, there's the accountant. So I, it's sort of having that network that I can refer out to yes. to say, you know, I'm literally going to specialise and sort of swim between the flags and everything else can go out to experts if that's their need. Yeah. What, what about from a business operations perspective? Like clients have got to pay you somehow and like how, how do you, you know, do you have a bookkeeper? Do you have, does your licensee out with that? Or what, what do you do on that front? So so that sort of stuff in terms of the of the of the payment, everything's collected by the licensee. Yep. Uh, I don't have a bookkeeper because from a revenue point of view coming in, there is a, a fortnightly payment. So that it's done. I keep an eye on, you know, if any direct debits fail, it's, you know, us on the phone going, hey, and, you know, just let us know when we can re-debit because it hasn't gone through. A lot of the stuff runs through the investment accounts because I don't want to have to have that conversation with the accountant going, you haven't worded your um, summary, you know, this is the advice and this is the summary of costs. So when we can, we just run it through uh, through an investment account. Uh, yeah across Seagull or whatever it is. Yep. And then in terms of payments out, there's not an enormous amount. A lot of the stuff's recurring, you know, for the tech side of things. I've got the rules set up in zero. You know, a lot of that stuff is is done. I think the, the thing that I probably have to put a rule in for is, you know, buying milk and coffee for the others, yeah. and that's pretty well it. Yeah. So that's in all the bookkeeping side of things. It's, it's pretty skinny. Yeah, nice. It's good to hear because, as, as you said, there, there is – a lot of, you know, there's, I've spoken to, to, to a number of advisors and just listening to other episodes, yeah, there's there's a lot in that space where they're kind of saying, well, it is being a solo advisor, having my little business, a couple of you know, employees, is that sustainable or not? And and I agree with your sentiment that there, there seems to be this the, the, this sentiment out there that possibly it's not sustainable and there needs to be a bit of safety and numbers um, coming together. 
I think the one thing that I have put it, well, we're in the middle of putting in place at the moment is, is another guy who runs his own business. And I approached him and said, listen, I want to put a buy-sell agreement in place because I want certainty that if I, my wife is convinced that I'm going to get eaten by a shark, I'm going to drown, and there's a scenario where, you know, all of it happens together. But, you know, I sent him, I, I want the certainty of knowing that she's not going to have to worry about you know, getting stuck into the business and trying to get it ready for sale. So he's been with, you know, within the same licensee. I've known him for years and I said, look, if it, if I go, I want to know that the business is now yours and that's your problem. But that we've got the funding in place that it literally is a tick and flick exercise. Fantastic. Great way of dealing with it. Yeah. And I look up because if, you know, the conversation started, you went, well, your business is bigger than mine. You know, what's in it for you? And I said, what's in it for me is the fact that I've effectively sold my business. My business now is your problem. And in, this, in the same way, your wife doesn't want to get, uh, no, know his wife, but she doesn't want to get involved in selling the business. He literally wants to be able to go, there it is, it's gone. She's got the the, um, the value of the business extracted already. And then his business becomes my problem. Yeah. And I think, you know, for, for the two of us, that's that parking solves the sole the operator sort of issue yeah. and and from your social media if you're adding your canoe at 4 a.m catching fish or something like you seem to be on the weekend i can understand your wife's so worry about a shark <laughs> <laughs> get there's been there have been a couple of couple of uh moments where i've uh you know just second second guess myself but yeah it's um it's good yeah nice so I, I wanted to pick up a bit on the conversations that we had last time when we, when we were talking just said you like you kind of came out of the bank and you what I remember you saying, whether they were the exact words that you, that you said, you kind of got a little bit lost kind of on your own until you, until you stumbled across Ensemble and, and you, you commented, so it stuck with me, you said you, you felt like you'd found your people and, and you, you, know, you said you're consuming a lot of the podcasts and you've picked up little bits and pieces from different people of explaining how you know, they're using different elements. Can you, can you walk us through, I guess, you know, firstly, how, how you've kind of built your service? Like what do you... You know, someone someone reaches out to you, like we get in a bit of you know we kind of we all like to geek out on on the tech that we're using. Like walk us through the process of someone reaches out to you, you contact them somehow, you know, making file notes, delivering advice. Can can you talk us through how that works and the and the different pieces that you're using in that process to to make your life a whole lot easier, so you're not you know, bashing up file notes and things. So there's a couple of things. So I thought my process was pretty good. Uh, I was very comfortable and it's sort of been developed in different iterations for um, 10 or 12 years. And I got to the point where I went, I probably need to grow the business a little bit quicker. And that's why I engaged a coach. So Steve Selvier had been on here um, and I went to him going, right, I don't know where my next client's coming from and this is the problem that I want you to help them solve. The stuff that he solved for me in part was that, but probably, you know, a bigger piece that he helped me solve was, was what does that process look like? Yeah. And what, you know, how do you, how do you look after the people that you want to, but also respectfully say to somebody, you're not, you're not going to sit here and they will advise a few, but it's, it's not going to be me. Um, and I went and going, if I'm going to pay him what he's charging, I've got to go in with a really open mind and, and I've still got to try absolutely everything that he tells me to do. I might not like it. It might feel that comfortable. I might think I know better, but you got to go in with that open mindset of I'm going to do absolutely everything that I'm paying him to guide me through. His process is phenomenal. Now, my conversion ratio uh, before going to Steve, I was pretty happy with it. The conversion ratio afterwards is unbelievable. Because his process of sort of pre-assessment is is really really strong. So you know things like um, the TikTok or you know uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever it is, it's going to be linked in the bio to book a fifteen-minute chat. But in order to book a fifteen-minute chat, I want mobile, email, and you've got to answer five questions. Now, if somebody says, oh, I'm not working full time, I don't have enough spare cash flow, I need you to help me remortgage something, that's a really quick um, response. Hey, um, you know, I might even pre-record them a video. 
and say, it's not really my thing. I can see what you try to do. Yeah, is if you want an intro to somebody who looks or feels like this, here we go. It cost me five minutes instead of, sounds cold, but wasting an hour, an hour and a half with somebody that is just not going to fit my business. Yeah. Um, and that screening process is, is really, you know, is really good, really strong. And then, you know, if we get on that call, I've already got sort of a predefined process to go through and weed out the people that I don't think are going to be a good fit. And that, so that, even even that initial screening where someone clicks on a link to book a 15 minute phone call, are you using Calendly for that? Like, what, is it Calendly you're using? And acuity. then you've got quite acuity. Okay. Well, you, you could use, you could equally use Calendly, but I don't use it. And, and then so that so then you've built a template, you know, you built a workflow, whatever you want to call it in there, that prompts some name, email address, phone number, answer these five questions. Correct. And and then I guess that itself is going to filter out some people as well because as I'm not answering these five questions, forget about it and they disappear. Absolutely. Right. They, they you know, they're not okay. So so there's the acuity part there. So you have this phone call with someone and you'd say, Yep, I agree, we can Help, I can help you in some way, shape, or form. Yep. What happens next? What happens after that? So after we book something, so if they, you know, if they say, oh, I'm not sure what my partner's diary looks like, I'll send them the direct scheduling link and go, when you found a time for both of you, pick in the link. I've got a pre, and this is again Steve's sort of uh, process, I've got a template. And it, it'll sound really silly, but it's saved as a signature in Outlook. So instead of having to retype the damn thing and, you know, I've got a little intro video, a little bit about us, this is how we operate, who we look after, how you might feel, here's some questions. All of that stuff is, is literally, I click on the, um, the initial meet and greet signature, it all adds in, it's got the video in, and away we go. So that's that bit booked in. And then... We, we start to go through the advice process. So the first meeting, it's 90 minutes, and there's literally, you know, he's, again, it's sort of Steve's process here. It, it goes through, you know, all of the stuff that we need to, and it does effectively, if you, if you think about it, Mike, is the sales piece. It's not, I, I'm not a big one for selling stuff. I, I'm not a salesy sort of guy. Um, but it takes you through that process and go, we're going to start here. These are the things that we're going to do. Here's where you're stuck. This is how we're going to do it. This is how it operates. This is the fee structure. This is what's in it for you. Signed, yeah, and we'll book the second meeting. And it, it runs almost exactly to 90 minutes every single time. And it's a really, it's such a good process because it brings out all of the stuff that people are worried about. And all of the things that we can do as advisors, and it shows these are the things that we can do. It matches them up. I run a you know a, a flat feeding model only. There's no commissions, and it literally you know I talk them through all of that stuff. It pretty well answers everything they can possibly want. And if you're not sure at the end of of ninety minutes, then that's okay. Might be that you need to find someone else, find someone different. And, you know, we had that conversation right up front to say to people, I want you to be really critical of me. I want you to I want you to judge me really harshly on two, two different sort of facets. One is the personal, the other is profession. So if you think that I'm a really smart guy that'll make your skin crawl, it's not going to work. Yeah. And if you think that I'm a lovely guy but not particularly switched on, again, it's not going to work. And because I want them to think about this as advice, but it's the relationship bit, and in the two, you have to have to match up. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. So, in anticipation of that first ninety-minute meeting that you're having with them, are you asking them to share any further information with you beforehand, other than what you've gathered in the phone call? No. So that that first meeting is tell me what your pain points are. This is the things that we can. The, you know, this is what we can do to solve those problems. We're going to get you to here. At that stage, you probably don't even know, to, you know, asset position. Um, we get an idea of sort of the income that the income and, and assets may come out in that conversation, but we get to the point where I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on, and they'll say, right, this is the fee structure. Um, sign here to say that you engage in my services to write the SOA, um, and then we'll book a second meeting, and then I'll say that at the end of this meeting, I'm going to send you a link. And I want you to click on the link, and I want to put—I want you to put all of the details in. I 
I'm not a patient guy with that. So, you know, that like the what is your name and your date of birth? I don't have the time and patience to do that. So I get the clients who fill out the fact find themselves. They do the risk profile themselves. Um, and in that second meeting, we'll go through that together and go, right, let's just sense check the stuff that you use. So I use Advice Revolution uh, and then the sort of the CRM PCs X plan. And yeah. there's two way sort of push and pull. Yeah. So the front end of X plan, the last time I looked at it, wasn't something that I want to no, I've looked at it and it's some the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I did you know, with Advice Revolution. It's, yeah. you know, it looks and feels pretty good. It allows that push. And I don't have to fill out a fact find. Uh, the risk profile was a, like a real game changer for me because if I have to ask that set of questions again, I think, you know, the frustration, it, it's wasted time. I want them to answer those questions so that I don't steal or guide. And then once we've got the the indicative new rent growth profile or whatever it is, then that's the bit in the discussion that I really want to have. So you've indicatively come out as this. I've got a slide deck that I run through and go, this is what it actually means. This is what the emoji of investing. This is the difference between a growth and a high growth and a growth and balanced. The good times, the bad times, how does that feel? And then we start to get, for me, that's a much better discussion than, um, you know, the tick box exercise. Yeah, I was going to ask how you, how do you sense check that um, that risk profiling exercise? Because you can, you know, we, I, you know, I do it in a ask every client the same kind of set of questions as part of a meeting. I'm ju- I've just done one earlier today. And yeah, you, you're kind of getting into the, I'm just asking the same, I'm asking different people, but the same questions over and over and over. You're since just checking that along the way and, and it's interested to see how you deal with that at the end. So if someone answers a set of questions, but then you're circling back to say, okay, this is what it actually means. The way that you've answered these questions, this is what it actually means for you. Yep. And then you put your advisor hat on, you can kind of gauge whether you think it's a true reflection of what they're actually up to and where they're at. Exactly. So so when if I asked you those questions, I can steer your answers in the way I asked them. Yep. And I can put more emphasis on the answer that I think is most relevant. And I want to remove my sort of inherent bias yeah. from that thing. What you know, once they've answered the question, then we can have the discussion and we can do the sense check. And I for me, I think there's a lot more value in sense checking it and saying, look, you've said this but we're also trying to shoot for the stars, but you want to be ultra conservative. Uh, let's have a look at that uh, and sort of, you know, I've got the, you know, the Vanguard charts and the, I've, you know, there's a whole bunch of charts that I've collected um, over time, and then I'll, you know, talk through, uh, talk through that stuff. But if I had to ask those questions uh, around the risk profile, it is, oh, it's, it's painful. And, and that's advice revolution as well, the, the risk profiling through advice revolution? Is that something Yeah, separate? so you can actually, I mean, I, I preload it. So the loads is to be the, the risk profile questions, yep. and they are just, they literally just loaded that into it. So, so you have this second meeting with them, you're sense checking everything. At the end of that meeting, they're kind of agreeing, yes, this is, this is us, this is what I'm expecting of you. And then you go away and you do your statement of advice. Is that what happens after the second meeting? Yeah, so actually I've, I've left out a point. So at, at the end of the first meeting, they did the fact find, they did the yep. risk profile, and then we set them a series of tasks. And the tasks are, I want you to drag, I want you to sign the research authority. Um, I want you to sign your, drag and drop that into the portal. I want you to um, take your alt tape ID in the meeting. Um, but I want you to take a copy of your super statement, drag and drop that in there. Here's the insurance pre-assessment form. Don't skip that one. Every answer needs to be marked down add that to the portal as well. So by the time we got there, I already have, you know, they filled out the fact finder risk profile. I've got the research authority. So quite often we'll we'll have the research authority, you know, uploaded. And sometimes we'll even have the the, the super stuff, you know, the research dump. Mm. And part of that, you know, when we come to the second meeting, a lot of it is just a sense check. And I may even have some thoughts on strategy. When I do the super sounds silly, but and he, you've seen the, the horrendous TV show, The Voice. Yeah. So they like the blind auditions. What we do is I'll put enough for an X plan and I'll say, right, here are three soon fronts. This one's really low cost and it's got low features. This one's quite expensive and also has low features. And this one is 
high features and high cost. Let's have a look at the cost, the features, and then the performance. You pick your fund. I don't really mind which one. It's very rare that somebody's going to pick the industry fund that they're with that is high cost and low functionality. They either go with the really low cost uh, index option hmm. or the bull rat, you know, offering. Yep. yep. Um, but from an advice point of view, when you take the labels off, it takes away their, you know, bias towards one fund or another, one style of fund. And then, you know, if from a file learning point of view, that's a really easy conversation. And when I play that back to them at presentation stage, do you remember when you picked this fund? Well, now, you know, this is the name of the fund. It is Superfund X. You already know what the performance has been roughly, but let's go through the makeup and the portfolio and the rest of it. Mm-hmm. From a compliance point of view, it's interesting because they, they got picked up at, at audit uh, and the bike started laughing. He's like, the voice, he goes... That's a really bad show, but in the way that you position you said, like, it's, it's actually really interesting to watch somebody go through that process or read through your, your file notes on that process and how they'll select it. As- it's a, I'm, I'm interested in the file note part. Like, is that a recorded meeting you're having with the client? Is it? Are you recording what they're saying or, or are you just making file notes after the fact? No, I just make file notes after the yeah. I'm not a big fan of recording meetings because a lot, like I tend to... S- you know, the way that I view advice, a lot of it is about, you know, head versus height. But I would say at least once a month, somebody's in tears and laughs because I want to talk about what, you know, what keeps you awake at night, what scares you and what gets you really excited. Sometimes it's that relief of, Ugh, I'm going to be okay. And I've been holding it in so tight that, you know, somebody will burst to tears or somebody last week is going through this enormous change in their life and I said, talk me through it. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to record that stuff. Yeah. It feels quite invasive, and and I, I don't want that. But from a file that point of view, I've always looked for efficiencies, the business um, bottlenecks, and anything that I dislike. So any negatives, and you know, for me, file notes was some. I just don't, I just don't like doing them, and I looked at them and went right. I am procrastinating here because I don't want to type them out. So I went right. We'll get rid of that, and I. I've probably been using, I use Dragon Speak and I have been for probably 14 or 15 years now, but yeah, right. Um, you know, for me, that was a way of saying I don't have to type my file notes. And then I found that I was delaying doing Dragon Speak, you know, from a behavioral point of view, why? And I went, oh, well, it's because I've had to use a USB headset and I've got to take it out of its case and then plug it in and unfold it and put it on and the headset's uncomfortable. And that sounds silly. But I could, I could see and notice that that's where a delay went. And I went, right, I've now got an external bike that sits on the desk. You plug it in and you talk. You know, so from that point of view, it's trying to cut out anything that's going to delay advice getting, uh, you know, underway. Yeah. And, and is that how you kind of, your, your SOA request, whatever you want to call it, and how you ask your power planner to write your statements of advice for you? Is that yeah. the same thing? So, so drag and speak notes about whatever your strategy might be, or how how you dealing with that part? Then the reason is that I I hate the parent funder request forms. Um, I've gone through various iterations, and everyone just I, I find intensely irritating. And so I just use Loom, open up the thing, and you know what I found is that because I didn't like the form, and it would take me half an hour to fill it in or whatever it was, I was procrastinating. You leave, you know that that form uncompleted and you you create a three-day lag in your process. It's awful. And I broke it down and went, right, how long is it going to take me to do the recommendations around super? It's really simple. Click the go button on Lynn. Um, and I always love, hey, Joe, you know, this is the overview of the plan. This is the client. These are the bits that I'm excited about. Um, these are the bits that we're going to have to be careful of. Here's the fee structure. Like That's even it's a two-minute video and I just Put the link in the in the email to her. The next one is these are the super recommendations, and it's so quick because I, like I know what the supers get. You know before your meeting's finished what your super recommendations are likely to be. They're going to be fairly close to the mark because you've been doing this for so long, and it takes me two minutes to tell somebody, you know, what we want, what the alternatives were. That's really quick, and it's so it's so different from a mindset point of view of here at five. 
one to two minute videos on the recommendations rather than here's a 35 or 40 minute tough jack form that I want to poke myself in the eye over. Yeah. I've got to adopt that myself. It's uh, it's one of the one of the pain points just from my, in my own process, advice process is do these meetings and finalize the fact find and all the rest of it. And then it's, okay, get it, bridging it from the thoughts that are in my head and the notes that I've m- made, bringing those two together for someone to pick it up and, and organize the SOA. So is that, is you so, think about your skill set and, and not just you and I, but as advisors in general, the skill set is sitting down and talking to people. You know, yes, there's the pointy head and stuff around the technical side of things, but a big part of it is being able to sit and talk to people. And if that, you know, if, if you've got a verbal skill set or it's something that you enjoy, it's so much easier to talk through things than type out, and, even if it's, you know, voice recognition software or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so you request the SOA, is, is that the, the power planner, is that someone that's internal with you? Or you yes. Just, yeah. Yeah. I've tried the external piece and, and what I've found is that there was turnover. I also don't do SOAs. You sort of traditional SOAs anymore, and I have you know for quite some time. Yep. And to get an external service to work in with what I want, uh, it it was me getting up with them, and I, you know, I, I don't go you know, much in that, and I don't like the the delay piece as well. And I, you know, the, the delays are really important for me because I'm a it's a small business, and if I'm trying to compete with bigger, better resource businesses, I'm going to be nimble and I'm going to be good. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, if, if I write, uh, it's all it, everything's about short about time frame for me. Because if I write five hundred grand's worth of revenue and I'm doing it over five years, I'm going to go break, and then I'm going to close the doors, and I'm going to go and have to find a job. But if I can have all those time frames down, if I can write five hundred in one year, well, things look very different. Then, if, um, so it's trying to cut out, you know, all of the delays and get the advice in and done, if, you know, efficiently. You mentioned there it doing SOAs a little bit differently. Can, can you talk about what you're doing there? Yeah, so actually this comes back to like this podcast probably four, four odd years ago. Mm. And you know, I, don't, I don't know the other guys involved in this literally through listening, but it's, you know, it was an interview that uh, Andrew Rocks was doing. He said, oh, we do some stuff uh, differently in our business. One of the things that we ask our clients is, how do you want to be communicated with? Do you want a physical document? Do you want a text message, an email, a, you know, an, an audio message? And I can remember where I was driving home and just on dusk and I went, oh, holy shit. I hadn't pulled over, got my phone out, and my phone's full of notes, but I went, that is, that's brilliant. You know, first, why haven't I thought about that? But the way that he articulated that was Fantastic. And it's an idea, it's sort of at the core of, of how, you know, we provide the advice, but it's at a different iteration. So, you know, I'm looking at the stuff that intensely frustrates me, things like RLAs. But nobody reads that thing. I'm going to send you a 10-page document that's taken three days or four days to produce, and I've sent the request, and then I've checked it, and then I've stopped it. So, and it was, so, you know, his, his question was, um, how do you want to be communicated with? And shortly after that, Ben Nash was talking about, uh, he said, oh, when we bring new people on board, we've got this training manual and we use this bit of software called Loom. We'll do screen recording and then they've got a training log. And I went, well, I'd, I'd better do that. So I've done that. And then with, if I can use Ben's idea and Andrew's together, I can sort of hit a couple of issues at, at once. So mm-hmm. Particularly with things like ROAs, we started doing video ROAs probably three, three and a half years ago. And, you know, we, we've got to hit a couple of points from a compliance point of view, but it's a Word doc with like the, the button switches or whatever it is, whatever it changes. And, you know, it's picking the go button on Loom and saying to the client, hey, when we caught up these and things that we spoke about, we'll remember that these were the changes that we're going to make. And these are the consequences, CGT, fees, whatever it is. And also we did the modeling because we always did the modeling and you can remember that we're shooting for retirement or whatever goal it is and you're on track and you don't need to do anything but this video just summarizes this. If you need anything, let me know. And the feedback from clients was really, really good because I'd say to them, hey, do you want a 10-page document 
to talk about the switches. And they're like, no, I, I don't need that stuff. But the video, I, it's not uncommon for me to see somebody commenting on Lynn, hey, Joe, I love this. Great to have a reminder. Um, so that was the first iteration. And I, I couldn't get the, you know, I'm doing video SLAs at Happy. And the, so I got signed off late last year. But compliance and legal were comfortable with the simplicity of an ROA, but not an SLA. And, you know, so it was this sort of long winded process of going, I've got this idea and I know what I want it to look like, but either the technology or the compliance isn't there. Yeah. And we've now got it signed off. Uh, back in last year from legal and, and the deal group were really supportive. <laughs> um, and they went, right, you know, we trust your compliance record and we trust that you're not going to say anything stupid, so go for gold. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, the, you know, the SOAs, it's all, um, you know, it's done on a PowerPoint presentation, it's a deck of slides, it's got pictures, I've integrated small videos, that sort of stuff in there. Um, but the bit that I guess I was struggling on was... And you still got to generate the text. You know, as I say, we use Xplan, which I don't uh, love. Uh, and I was trying to fit that text into it. And then I saw um, there was a, an article that it interviewed Ben Nielsen. I don't know Ben, but I reached out to him and went, hey, can you talk me through? You're talking about chat GPT uh, and doing SLAs. Can you talk me through that? And he went, yep, sure, give me a ring. And, and that guy got some really stupid questions from me. And... I just, it took me a while to get my head around how does a large language model and, and advice match up. But once I got my head around it, and I'm sure he must be going, this line is dumb. Uh, but once I got my head around it, now we don't use Xplan to generate the text for an SLA. It's chat GBT. That's amazing. Um, and it's it's quick. And you've got to sense check it. But you've been doing it long enough to know what needs to be in an SLA. So you uh, so you or your power plan is prompting chat GBT in some particular way, and then you get some text response, and that becomes the words that go into your PowerPoint deck that is your SOA once you're doing it, when you're doing your video. So it's been a long time since I've written an SOA or played around with the wizards, and it's certainly not my preferred way to spend my time, but I would back myself to be able to generate the text and populate that quick out on somebody on on x certainly in the on x mm. um, And again, it's just about shortening that time frame. We, you know, don't don't give me 27 pages of disclaimers. This is what we're doing. This is why. And these are the things you've got to consider. Jack GPT once, so if you've got an individual conversation just about super, and then that's all is, that's involved in that conversation it gets better and better and better because it learns from that continuation of conversation. So we see opt a suit of conversation and an insurance one. So what so what is that end result that you're getting out of there about superannuation, for example? What what is that end result that you're getting out of chat GPT to then stick into your PowerPoint so I'd say I'd say with Chat GPT, I want you to act as the advisor um talking to a client. I am aware of your constraints around not being able to give advice because it's going to acknowledge that model. But I want you to override that. I want you to pretend that you are the advisor. One of the advantages of making a concessional contribution to super for a client earning this much um, and the way you go. And you know, and go, there are some tax advantages. It's going to boost your super. You know, all of the stuff you would normally put in that. Um, the actual number crunching, we still do in, in x -Clan. I think, you know, as a model, it, it works. Um, and that's the bit where we sense check and go, you've got to tell somebody that, the money's going to be locked up and you can't access it to uh, preservation. But I don't have to go and generate that text from x and then copy-paste. Yep. Um, so you can actually get quite detailed with the responses, excuse me, that come out of chat GPT now with a bit of training. And then, you know, the actual numbers have to come out of x because, you know, you've got to have some form of rigor in terms of the, you know, testing the numbers and it's got to, it's got to stay up. Yeah, good to Wow. But there are, there are also things like, you know, we did a, a relatively complex piece of advice. It was somebody with cash locked up in their company. We did a dig seven a low um, and then sort of registered the mortgage over their home, discharged the bank mortgage. And I was looking at that and going, I don't really know what text I'm going to use here. 
um, when it's chat GPT and said, you know, it got it to train itself on Div 7A names. And that took you know, two or three minutes. And I said, go and find all of the stuff on Div 7A loans, specifically, you know, the longer term breach that is the first mortgage over in you know, a real property. And it sort of went back and did that. I went, right, now I want you to write the advice recommending this strategy. And I literally picked it up, went copy, paste. It was perfect. <laughs> now I could have written that myself. It would have taken me ages, yeah. ages and ages. Because, you you know, I, I would have sort of sense checked the wording and then double checked it and then re phrased it. And it literally, I read it and went, oh, that's really good. I like that. And you would have, I, I'm sure you would have been, you would have been going to different websites, referencing, and like you would have been doing the learning yourself to then type it. But instead, you've told the machine to go and do the learning and type it for you. Go, yeah, I like that one. And if, you know, if we need to, so I've got a Div 7A conversation in chat GPT. So if I do another one of those strategies, even if it's, you know, if you, if you did the shorter per seven, seven year term, I can go and subtly alter that conversation and go, we're now going to shift the focus from the, the long term to the short term. This is what we're looking at. And can you save, can you save those conversations in chat GPT? They're all saved. So uh, the only way to get rid of the conversation is to delete it. But you, you want to keep the conversation separate. So we wouldn't add any Div 7A stuff into the soup conversation and I wouldn't add soup into insurance. Ah, I haven't realised that. I've go in there and play around every now and then, but I hadn't realised that it was all saved there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. so there's a there's a menu on the left-hand side and we've yeah. actually got one called Sumo. And that's going back to, to Bevin. Yeah. Because he's... You know, so I understand how smart the man is, but it, it was him talking me through, this is how we use it. Now, he's obviously spent a lot of time doing it, not basically piggybacked off his guidance and you know and, and initial research. But it's it's incredibly smart in terms of generating the sort of text that you probably want to put in there. Yeah. And it gets, you know, to learns, you know, over, over time. Yeah, right. Well, John, I thank you for your time today. I know you've got a meeting to get to. I've got uh, other meetings to get to as well the, this afternoon. As I did when I spoke to you the first time, incredibly generous with your time. And, and even now, as we've been recording, we, we're getting close to an hour of recording this. So um, thank you for spending the time chatting with me. I've learned a lot. Hopefully anyone that's listening has done as well. Congratulations on what you've what you've built in only you know, four or five years. So you've, you've done a tremendous job. Uh, on their own. Well done. You. And uh, lots of gold in there that, in that, this episode, that's for sure. I hope so. The, this podcast, without the podcast, my business would look very, very different from old school. And uh, you know, I'm quite excited about some of the stuff that we're doing, but a lot of it comes back to the people I'm here who are you know, so free with their info and time and, and knowledge. Yeah. Thanks, Jermaine. I'll, uh, I'll chat with you again soon. Thanks very much.